Good evening all. Just sorting out the board uh, just to be a bit better. Okay, I hope the board is okay uh, for everyone on live stream following this. Um, right. So, I thought we could look at uh, another selection of, of towel games. Um, I wonder if the board can be slightly tweaked or is it okay? Is, is everyone okay with the board? On live stream, um, I'll put the chats together from both live stream audience, chat space audience. I'm just gonna put both chat windows together. Okay, just arranging my windows, ready to go. Um, yeah, I was exhausted. I played a, a tournament over the weekend. Um, I didn't do that well. I had a match last night as well. It can can be very exhausting. Uh, <clears throat> so did a few videos today on YouTube. So YouTube com Kings Crusher. Um, this is a bit of a late showing this Tuesday night because I think um, the Tower Memorial and there's uh, I was pushed back later today. So um, I've checked my other Tower videos on YouTube by the way, and I've put in the descriptions the actual games that were involved. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going to cover a game twice by accident today. Um, so this was against Marks Pasman in uh, 1953. Um, so we have two choices here. We could wait another a few minutes because there's a previous uh, broadcaster still broadcasting, or we could um, go ahead right now. Um, are some of you, some more of you, are coming on the chess base server? Um, should we, should we just get into it? Should we just go ahead now? Okay. All right, we'll go ahead now. So um, E4. Uh, so this is... Um, and then a Sicilian defense. Knight F3 from Mikhail. So Mark's Pesman, he played uh, D6. Uh, now open Sicilian. Uh, and um, coming up to... Uh, Kasparov's favourite move, a6. Uh, so that's a um, very important waiting move in the Sicilian. And um, Mikhail played uh, the sharp f4 move. Okay. So black uh, against f4 um, might might be a bit concerned about e5. Uh, that's something distinctive. Uh, does black really want to play e6 here? Maybe. But black actually played... Um, to stop e5 altogether, actually. Uh, actually, I had a, a rapid game last night against a very strong rapid player, David Sands, and he got control of e5 with a knight, and it was quite nasty. So maybe that's Black's idea. If Black can can play this, takes, and later, you know, maybe get a knight to e5, uh, that would be a good knight square to get a knight on e5. So e5 might be a positional idea to get a strong knight on e5. Um, so knight f3. Knight BD7. So there's an option to, to be wary of, of black taking and then and occupying E5 and not minding perhaps about the backward pawn sometimes. Okay. So Bishop D3 was played. Bishop E7. Both sides now castle. King H1. A bit of prophylaxis against this diagonal. Any checks which might be annoying. Safeguarded the king. So uh, B5. Which is logical. Put the bishop here to exert more pressure on e4, uh, especially with b4. So it's a good, uh, good idea often to play b5. Not only that, of course, from the semi-open c file, uh, c4 is important strategically. So sometimes knight b6 to c4 as well to collect the light square bishop. Here, the light square bishop is blocked in by its own pawn. So is this diagonal that important to actually win the light square bishop for black? I'm not so sure. But uh, e4 control is important for white anyway, and he, maybe he didn't want b4 to chase away his knight on c3. So Mikhail did decide actually to play a3. And now we have uh, queen c7. Okay, so queen c7. And um, okay, what does Mikhail do here? He plays actually f takes e, uh, d takes. So potentially, I don't know these squares seem a bit vulnerable. D5 and F5, uh, a little bit. Um, 
But this bishop being hemmed in, maybe is, is that a concern for the attacking player? Has white got potentially a move like knight h4 to get to f5, or is that uh, is that going to be refutable with knight e4? What, what can white do? Or maybe just knight g5? Just this semi open f file pressure might be a concern for black. In fact, Mikhail does now play knight h4, actually. Okay. I think uh, knight e4 is not on the cards, actually. This would be a terrible mistake, probably, because I think um, bishop takes. And then queen h5, uh, just just eyeing h7, and here uh, that would be bad. And if f5 is check, or and then taking the bishop, that's that's not good. So knight h4 can be gotten away with to get to that f5 square. So that looks like a key square on the semi-open file, uh, just like uh, this is a key square for black on the semi-open c file. That f5 is important for white. Okay, so the pressure might be increasable now. Knight c5, and now we have bishop g5. Okay, the queen now goes to d8. Um, maybe you know, black's concerned about here. Bishop takes f6, and uh, knight d5 will be hitting the queen and f6, so that would be pretty nasty. So, queen d8 maybe is a safety move, attempted safety move. Uh, so white plays knight f5. Okay, threatening to get rid of black's important defensive bishop and then take on f6. So bishop takes f5, rook takes f5. And uh, now black uh, plays a move to exchange off the dangerous bishop on g5. And he's also reinforcing e5. So it looks as though this might be okay for black. It's still quite solid. Um, White now did Mikhail did take on e7. He's got the d5 square, he uses that d5 square. Okay, so queen d6. So, so far, so good it seems for black. Black's fairly solid. Um, how does white exert more pressure? Well, he hasn't got his rook into the attack yet, so these rooks are not speaking to each other that much yet. Um, okay, okay, so queen g4. Uh, Duvid writes something very interesting actually. Um, say from last week, chosen style was more focused on sealing the advantage and not leaving any room for the opponent to get an edge. As well, Tell pushes into the attack much quicker, yeah, uh, with less regard for the opponent's attack. So, Queen g4, yeah, this is very direct. So, already, you know, there's a frontal attack straight on the king, but where is it heading? Okay, white's going to double up rooks and maybe f6 is going to be tactical. But this bishop being hemmed in, is that a concern? It's holding up the center, e4. Okay, black does weaken a few squares, g6. It's not really threatening anything at the moment. Brook f1, and we have f6. But now uh, an attempt at softening the black king position, softening some squares, g6 can be softened here. h4, try and soften it with h5, and that starts, starts to look a little bit dangerous. Okay, so king h8, preparing against that. The rook is now attacked, the rook moves back. So we've got a little bit of pressure. All of white's pieces are quite good. Uh, there's a focal point on f6 at the moment. h5 might still be on the cards. Black actually um, plays f5, which seems good actually from the point of view of undermining the knight on d5. That surely white cannot take because of the knight on d5. Is that the case? Um, now you guys are on on the chess base server. I hope you can you can seal the score sheet. You can you can avoid looking at the score sheet if you click on a different tab like openings book. I think that can be achieved. So I can ask you to think about the next move. What would you play here? If I give all of you ten seconds, can you guess what White's next move is here? So ten seconds, starting from now. Okay, I've just told you as if uh, e takes f5 wasn't possible, but in fact that's the very move Mikhail uses. So he leaves the knight as a sacrifice, and that sacrifice is taken. Uh, so okay, there's two pawns for it, but there's also an immediate threat now of g7 check to to be um, dealt with. Okay, 
so how does black parry g7 um there's also you know if rook g8 it looks as though queen h5 and the bishop's actually um potentially useful there's no there's no e4 there because the, the pawn's pinned against the queen if we look at that rook g8 so i think queen h5 and there's no e4 sorry there's a, there's a mate there's a mate threat here anyway pardon me so that looks pretty terminal there's no time for e4 or anything um uh and e4 is impossible anyway so forget e4 so so this this looks crushing so black actually just took on f3 as, as the method of attempted defense now uh Mikhail uses a little Zwishen Zug. he doesn't recapture he plays a check uh king g8 and another double Zwishen Zug. can we call it a double double Zug? is that a new term i'm going to make it up now double Zug, short for double Zwishen Zug. so instead of recapturing the rook again Another interruption, inter interruption check move, which transforms the position quite a bit. Uh, again, um, I wonder if you guys can guess it. Um, well, the clue was it was a check. Uh, so ten seconds here. Uh, uh, okay, maybe not needed. Um, there's not too many checks to consider. Uh, okay, so bishop takes h7. I'll speed that up. So double Zwischen Zug, double Zug. So king takes. So two pieces down. Black has uh, two knights, and I know from from the bitter experience on the weekend, being you know pieces up by the opponent having the attack, it's unpleasant still sometimes to defend um, if if your king's exposed and these concrete cat tactical threats. They're they're hard to sort of parry um, all the threats all the time. So rook takes f3. So black's two knights up. Um, so is there going to be a two knights defense here? um what are the threats anyway here to consider uh well qu queen f5 looks quite quite tasty uh you know with with the idea of king takes uh rook g3 and then, then mating uh so that's maybe one thing um so g3 may be an idea it seems to take g3 away from the rook so maybe that's what this this defensive move is partly about that black played knight e4 here so at least he's depriving Mikhail of, of rook g3s but now um Mikhail carries on the attack with his pawns as well as the queen the pawns represent sort of attacking pieces around the king so he plays h5 which supports of course queen g6 now and then maybe h6 after this is what happens knight d f6 so we have uh, check. We have h6. Okay. So, right. So now there might be um, an idea of sacking the pawn temporarily and then playing uh, rook h3 for rook h8, maybe. That might be one idea um, on the cards. Now may, maybe this attack was indeed unsound. If if we'd put this into an engine, maybe an engine laughs here with black and finds a defensive resource. But um, you know sometimes it's tricky to defend your king with all the various checks. Um, okay, hi Einstein on on live stream. Okay, so um, the defensive resource chosen for black was uh, actually rook a seven and. Um, in the midst of all this, two knights down, uh, Mikhail plays a seemingly slow move to proceed now. Um, h7 probably doesn't work at all, actually, because if if h7, you know, knight takes rook h3, there's, the other knight can just come back, and both knights can support each other here and here. Um, so actually, Mikhail plays king h2, um, which I think gets the king out of dangers of, of checks for the moment um, preparing actually this next move which is rook h3 so now there's a concrete threat of h7 uh, which needs to be stopped blockaded and black does blockade the h pawn so he's still two knights up so what's happened here well you know but after this knight h7 um, unfortunately for black that there, there's another tactical liability that's just emerged here in the, in this very position that the rook now 
switches back to the center to attack the queen and all of a sudden there's a horrible threat an unpleasant feeling that actually rook d8 might be significant so rook d8 has to be parried and the knight has to be protected and this move next ticks both of those boxes that uh, the knight is still protected and d8 is, is protected okay so so far so good a little bit of discomfort there the rook and queen are really pushing um black's defensive resources a bit uh but unfortunately now there's a crunching move believe it or not even though uh black uh didn't seem to do too badly with his two extra knights whoops uh so i wonder if you can guess it a crunching move if i give you 10 seconds starting from now so time to test your tactics now if you're on chess base server please hide the score sheet so that these quizzes are more more fun so 10 seconds starting from now okay unfortunately there's a back row issue which has just been created or rather this rook d8 has more effect now because actually the weakness of the last move when black had retreated the knight like this there was a slight clue if we were one of those inspectors you know on these specs there's a slight clue uh, of weakness here that the knight's actually not supporting g8 slight slight problem that the knight is not supporting g8 and this next move takes advantage of g8 being slightly weakened queen takes e4 uh, unfortunately now after queen takes check this pawn is now able to queen with g8 check so the king moves and now white is only a knight down only a knight down now um for two pawns and the king exposed so i think black's really messed up really messed up he was two knights up and there's only one knight up for two pawns he must be feeling gutted by this point and there's still loads of checks and torture to come in this position so the first check rook d6 another check queen g6 and yet another check g3 and another one rook d3 which wins more material now because if the king moves the queen's lost uh, so unfortunately here queen takes d3 and then black also resigned with that move so all of a sudden from being two knights up black lost the thread there let's rewind let's do an overview and summary of that game so you know this is absolutely over uh if queen d3 but let's let's go through that game again black seemingly uh you know just two knights up in this game um Our players also written an interesting comment because we're, we're now sort of in a position more all of us to contrast Petrosian with Tao given the last few weeks uh players written a duvid about your observation um Tao counted on errors from his opponent while Petrosian chose to play more prophylactically and yet both became world champions which is great for the beauty of the game the diversity that you can you can uh, become world champion with, with a different style to another world champion and of course Karpov and Sparfa with different styles uh, you know sort of radically different styles um so here you know losing both knights it's kind of mystery game sort of fantasy game how does white manage to lose both knights and still win um this f5 was designed for for central damage for central control if if whites like us mere mortals might not have sacked the knight uh, we might have been you know trying to be conscientious with a conscientious type move it will be just end of game you know you know it's just totally loses actually you're losing a piece anyway actually uh because because d5 is being wrenched apart so in fact that the sacrifice was almost forced actually if we think about it here it was forced to play e takes f5 um but i suppose he made the you you know out of these pawns and this queen some sort of magic occurred it's not as if there's that many attacking pieces here after the bishop sack we've only got um you know the queen and the two pawns and yet this game still carries with it some sort of magic um i don't know what you guys think that it seemed to be quite a, a resourceful stunt that we've just witnessed that the two pawns here can conquer the two knights uh, but they did somehow uh, because um of this blunder really knight h7 uh, which tied down this knight passively coming up this king h2 
really created some rope, I think, to hang black with another mistake. You know, just playing King H2 after being two knights down, um, some opponents might consider resigning, but King H7, then there's a slight weakness of the last move about to be detected uh, or in created, because what does black do about H7 anyway? He's basically forced to move to create a weakness of the last move. So he's weakened G8, and all of a sudden G8 is now a tactical disaster. Uh, because of this, this, this queen sack, queen takes e4. I don't know. It seems it tells like um, some sort of engine strength, you know, Houdini. Because it, if you're winning against um, a computer, they will come back as well. Uh, you know, any window of opportunity, tactical opportunity, um, and it is, and it's all over now. You know, it's only one night up, and he's winning the two anyway. So interesting game. Um, I hope you agree there. So uh, let's go on to another game. Okay, uh, we'll go on to another game from my selection. Okay, now uh, Tao was playing uh, black here okay so this is um in 1953 so sort of early early earlyish games tell games the, these ones um now playing black after d4 he played knight f6 c4 c5 badoni invitation d5 e6 and now Maneka plays g3. Maybe he's a bit wary of Tal's, Tal's reputation. He wants wants to create the bishop uh, Fianchetto to sort of maybe strengthen his king safety a little bit. So Tal takes on d5. And actually plays b5 here, interestingly. Um, so b5, aggressively gaining space. Um, but is this the diagonal going to be significant? Is, is black going to play bishop b7 trying to undermine d5 or something he wants maybe to play b4 if knight c3 at some point uh white dislodges the pawn immediately with a4 and after b4 uh one would usually you know think that c4 is a comfortable square to make use of maybe uh later um especially if there's a pawn on d6 it could be useful to get a c4 for a knight maybe so c4 is actually sealed now uh with the move b3 uh, which also has the idea of of think uh, the bishop now, in more modern times, I've witnessed a similar game, actually, and I think a similar tactic to what we're about to witness uh, here. And it was actually an Ivanchuk game recently, which I did a video of on YouTube. There's something quite unbelievable, actually, about the liability on A1 and the bishop on B2. Potentially, their tactical liabilities, even though it seems white has got the initiative. Uh, G6, bishop G2 okay d6 now white plays e4 and i have bishop g7 so there's a discovered check sorry discovered attack threat on the rook on a1 okay which would seem to be uh parryable because all white has to do surely is play bishop b2 okay so the threat of knight takes e4 has been parried because there's a pin being created on the f6 knight right after castles the, the situation's changed slightly in that the bishop's now protected by uh, the king whilst this bishop is still unprotected so we've got a difference of these bishops facing each other that's a protected bishop that's an unprotected bishop okay so knight e2 now we have rook e8 as if everything's okay for white surely everything surely is okay for white there's a bit more pressure on e4 okay so it's protected naturally you want to protect e4 with knight d2 looks logical but now we see that black actually even though black usually doesn't have the initiative you would have thought white's one you know equal on this this contentious bishop diagonal but in fact black is the one that strikes with a tactic now and this is this is reminding me of the Ivanchuk game i also saw recently where Ivanchuk played a similar tactic can you guess 
Black's next move here, if I give you 10 seconds, starting from now. <clears throat> okay. The difference is, even though white seems to have, you know, the advantage of being white, the, the bishop's actually at a disadvantage to black's bishop. This is the king supporting black's bishop. So knight takes e4, uh, which affords a Zuishan Zug. Because of the fact that the black king is defending the bishop, there's a Zuishan Zug capability here. I, I, I'm tr uh, trying to extend our terminology re re revolving around Zuishan Zugs, because it seems um, Tao was a master of Zuishan Zugs um, and, and, and how they're created. He's got a protected piece versus an unprotected piece. So white uh, recaptures, uh, sorry, he takes on g7. And now the Zuishan Zug move is played. So not king takes g7, just losing a piece. But knight takes d2. Uh, so, so black's just nabbed a pawn. But what if, you know, his dark squares, does he really want to give up his dark square bishop? Surely uh, white has a dangerous uh, diagonal now, dangerous dark squares to exploit from this, this combination. So white moves the bishop, bishop h6. But the knight doesn't go anywhere. It's got nowhere to go anywhere. Uh, anyway, where is the knight going? It's stuck there. So he plays bishop g4, forcing uh, move, do something about e2. But the problem is the knight is actually on f3, so f3 is not playable. So all of a sudden there's a big problem here and in fact there's coordination now between the bishop and that knight on f3. White well, has to do something about uh, the e2 knight. So it looks to be a disaster now actually. White parries um, the e2 threat by playing bishop e3 but now of course knight f3 check is possible. So black has nabbed a pawn um, from, from, from that uh, opening. Just nabbed a pawn. And uh, white can't even castle, or, or no, he can technically castle here, but he chooses to move the rook. If he castles, then one would guess th this kind of stuff looks dangerous. Um, so he plays rook g1. So what a miserable position for white to have. He's just lost the pawn for nothing. And, you know, black's got this beautiful uh, light square bishop eyeing d5. A lot of pressure. So he plays now knight d7. So it's probably just winning for black here, actually. Queen d2, and now knight f6 just striking more at the poor d5 pawn. Knight f4 to defend d5, perhaps, that's the main reason. But now that's undermined, so d5 is dropping. Brutal stuff, starting from just, you know, a Zwischen Zug move has been proven uh, to be a killer. I don't know how much all of you think about Zwischen Zugs, but they seem to win games, game after game in the case of Tal. He's, he's winning another pawn now, virtually, with g5, if he's going to dislodge that knight. The knight retreats, but g5 is, of course, attacked. But he play, he doesn't take on d5 immediately. He puts even more pressure on it. He plays rook e5. So now, if bishop takes e5, of course, well, there's a problem, but you can play rook takes d5 um, now. White castles queenside. Okay, so knight e4, attacking the queen. The queen moves, c2. Now another forcing sequence to win even more material. He just takes on e2 for this fork, knight c3. And here white had enough. Um, he just resigned here. <laughs> so it seems, um, what do we learn from that? That an unprotected piece, maybe, can, can be the basis of a, of a very powerful Zwischen Zug. The unprotected piece on b2. Let's review that game now in overview and summary. So there's an unprotected piece created on b2, which seemed to offer black an amazing opportunity. Tao took an amazing opportunity here. Uh, that simply the act of castling is giving him the advantage here tactically. Uh, that after... In, in this sequence, that knight takes e4 is actually possible. But how does how does white defend, you know, e, e4 here? Could he have played... Well, here's a question. Could he have played f3? 
I'm not sure it looks like an ugly move to play f3 I think if Queen c2 that that fails tonight takes d5 does it um, because I'm thinking about this knight actually so it say takes 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 isn't Bishop a6 or maybe Bishop f1 yeah that that might be okay but it's I don't know Bishop f1 doesn't look as though it's wise um, to play Bishop f1 um, because you know maybe, maybe Knight d7 uh, okay um, but um, Queen c2 might might be better than what was played what was played was a disaster anyway so there must be an improvement surely so Knight takes e4 and uh, this this is the start of of the end already uh, now uh, after Bishop g4 it's it's miserable for white and d5 is now loose even looser and um, not only that Tal just forcibly wins the exchange strange game strange games these Wishen Zugs and stuff uh, you know very interesting so um, let's go on to another game So this is um, this this is uh, Burr Braga against Mikhail Tal played in Kharkov 1953. So another early Tal game. Some early games this 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 time. So d4 and uh, now we have uh, knight f6 after c4 c5 again. So this is like a favorite actually of the early towel in in the 1950s that he was playing for the Bononi uh, the Bononi's reputation was, was probably much stronger than today as a playable opening uh, so d5 e6 we have modern Bononi territory after knight c3 we're in, we're in the modern Bononi okay so the modern Bononi do we call it potentially losing trump cards that you, you get the potentially losing weakness here but you've got semi open e file pressure you've got a f poor majority on the queen side later you know it's got active play you've got active e5 square but uh, there's some downsides like this pawn structure you know if white can flood the center sometimes later with with e5 break that might be critical so the baloney at the time had a, a good reputation anyway in tal's hands it was pretty lethal so e4 i think gary Quillen, this this british i am is still playing the baloney uh, he played at London Classic, uh, I remember last year, I think. Uh, some people still play the Benoni. So g6, off the knight f3, bishop g7, bishop d3, and both sides castle. Now knight a6, which is a standard sort of plan to play knight c7, to put more pressure on d5, and also maybe to support a6 and b5 later. But also the knight can potentially go to b4 depending on the position and in fact here after knight d2 knight b4 is played and you might wonder what well, what's the point of this by the way there is a tau memorial and i should have i should have noted that as well so this is kind of thematic for the current super strong tau memorial tournament um which is one of the strongest tournaments all year so it's wonderful the GMs are sort of celebrating Tal as well, the super GMs. Um, so, um, okay. So what, what? why would the knight go to b4 and not to c7? Is there, what sort of positional justification is there? Because surely you might ask, is, isn't the knight going to be kicked back at some point? Okay, it kicks back the bishop. Rook e8. And white does kick back the knight. So what was achieved just then to drive the bishop back to e2? Was that of great significance? I'm not totally sure. The knight now goes back to c7, as I originally thought is usually the, like the intention. Because black's asset here structurally is, is to get his queenside, you know, pawn majority in action. 
so he works on that he plays rook b8 now a4 clamping down on b5 but now you don't have to go actually for this plan once white plays a4 you you can actually do other stuff as tell demonstrates here and in fact a a6 might run into um a5 here positionally so so that white always has the en passant so sometimes it's safer now if you want to play for this b5 plan it's safer to play b6 anyway so slowly prepare you know a6 and b5 okay so knight b5 and we have a, an exchange of knights with still black having um you, you know the, the possibility of of b5 so uh rook rook a2 which looks a little bit on the passive side of things uh queen e7 which kind of eyes black strong point square e5 now is black black can't play a move like this this bishop's eyeing h5 so black maybe wants to use f4 as well in the future but now sorry that's important that i've just noted that you see i've just noted knight h5 because instinctively i'm thinking dark square strategy here and it seems white's next move is is uh encouraging black's dark square strategy actually he plays actually f3 which of course the weakness of the last move it's not eyeing h5 so now Tal of course plays knight h5 the juicy f4 square why not get into that these two squares are key for the benoni player the dark squares in general why not okay so knight f1 and maybe you know why i was thinking you know the, the bishop's covering f4 but now we have f5 some pressure is being exerted onto white here it's it's looking like a pleasing attacking position because if you look at black's pieces they're all pretty good here nice bishop nice bishop you know that knight on on he doesn't have to play for b5 you know white's piece is sort of frozen here and, and silly just because of b5 on the queen side now you know tell striking on the king side uh so bishop d3 now f4 which which kind of seals the e5 square that juicy e5 square can be used as a pivot maybe you know black can use the pivot of e5 to get an attack going i would imagine so um g4 bishop d4 check and the queen does float in now queen h4 he's attacking actually the rook um so the rook moves now does he want to move the knight back um uh, not yet he plays another move queen h3 attacking the knight now okay so rook g2 so now surely he has to move the knight now yeah doesn't he doesn't he have to move the knight it's been improved for two moves surely he's going to move it now can you guess Tao's next move <laughs> if i give you 10 seconds starting from now what did Tao play here so 10 seconds starting now okay he plays actually um queen takes f3 so a knight sack it seems for two pawns if if white uh well if white wants to take um the might, might run into bishop h3 that's that's the problem here um so actually, actually uh white kicked the queen first maybe to avoid bishop h3 as a problem um now we have queen e3 which which looks as though it threatens actually something um like queen e1 maybe um or if if takes maybe bishop uh, bishop h3 not 100 percent sure what maybe i should be uh but there's also f3 as a threat and then queen one so actually the queen is kicked again with knight f1 the queen goes back to f3 and then are we going to draw by repetition the grandmaster draw here because the queen is again being attacked with knight d2 so has tau walked into a draw unfortunately no not quite uh, maybe this game might be on the unsound side 1953 this is the start of um, Mikhail's journey to become world champion okay so 10 seconds starting from now what does black play to avoid um 
a repetition. 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, he just sacrifices his queen. Bishop takes g4, and I don't quite believe this. I don't really want to engine check the game either. Um, you, you guys feel free to. I don't know. It just was it difficult to play for white. That's the question. You know, difficulty of playing the position as, as white. If it was that easy to play, then why, you know, why would there be a question that white's not winning this? So white snaps up the queen. So bishop takes f3. And what have we got here for the queen? What have we collected? Um, is it um, two minor pieces or just one minor piece and a few pawns? Uh, in terms of minor pieces, let's do a minor piece count. One, two, three. Uh, one, two. So it seems to be just one minor piece because both sides have two rooks. So factor out the two rooks. Um, it's just one minor piece and two pawns for the queen. Uh, so that's three plus two, five. Queen's usually worth nine. So that's like minus four, technically, or minus five. If you make a queen worth ten, we're talking minus four, minus five. Um, right. Concrete threats to deal with here. What are black's uh, threats here, in fact? Maybe uh, this pivot square, as I mentioned before, the Bononi e5 square is going to come to the rescue here, surely. <laughs> or maybe, outrageously, that was an outrageous idea. But that idea is, is ruled out anyway by White's next move. Just plays h4. So how is rook e5 to g5 now possible? So surely black's just the queen down for nothing. You might say. Well, he plays actually rook f8, which doesn't look like a killer move. But remember, that there is actually the lurking knight g3 checks to factor in here. Tal makes use of a knight g3 after bishop e2. He plays now knight g3 check. So he's going to win the exchange as well now, if he wants. Um, he plays bishop takes g2, winning the exchange. And unfortunately for white, um, after the knight takes e2, he's going to win the queen now. If, if the queen takes... There's f3 check. Whoops. <laughs> this, is, this is unfortunate indeed. Now, if he doesn't take, then now Tal actually has got quite a few pieces. If we assess the material situation here, um, okay, what materially has happened? Uh, there's two rooks now against only one rook uh, and um, two minor pieces against the bishop and queen so the material di difference um he's just gone up plus five is it player can you summarize the recent transaction he's just gone from minus four to sort of being slightly up on material so five plus five ten thirteen sixteen say the queen's worth nine uh plus five fourteen plus three seventeen white might be slightly up but he can't afford to lose the queen surely because He's not going to be that much material up now if he plays queen takes e2. In fact, he does play queen takes e2, allowing this check. So he's not going to be material up much at all. In fact, now we've transposed, after all that, into a position where Tau is a pawn up. <laughs> so the, that was fair enough. He's a pawn up. Four, six, five. He's just a pawn up here with, with good play. So check... So that that was like a strange strange dream there of what happened. I have no idea. From going from being material down to being a pawn up with a really good position and still with a nice e5 square. That was a neat little trick. Um, so bishop f4 exchanging off a key dark square defender by force. Where where else is the bishop poor bishop going? And then these pawns might be forked as well. So white actually resigned here. He's going to lose a, another pawn because. Say he takes, you know, rook takes f4, he's winning another pawn. It's a hopeless rook and pawn ending. Something really weird is happening in these games, you've got to say. Um, let, let's let's go back in overview and summary. So it's it seems as though, you know, white has, sorry, black has some tactical trump cards from the Benoni. 
Um, and something very strange in relation to them happens in this game. That okay, Black seem to have a fine position anyway, uh, a very fine position. Um, but um, surely uh, one Grandmaster um, who wrote Chess for Zebras, um, Rousen, has described this this particular Grandmaster weakness sometimes of what he calls wanting when the position on the board doesn't deserve you trying for a win. Now, was this a case of wanting to win um, unduly uh, un unduly rewarded? Uh, because Tao avoided uh, a perpetual uh, repetition here, yeah? And surely this is evidence that actually, yeah, the seven deadly sins. Is this a case of wanting, but actually he's wanting so badly to win he sacrifices his, his queen? Or did he know that by doing this, he's going to make great YouTube videos for me later in the, in later years after, <laughs> after. <laughs> he's just sacrificed his queen. It looks completely unsound. Does everyone agree this looks totally unsound? Or am I am I, am I thinking is is you know this, this is just unsound, isn't it? Bishop takes g4. I I think we don't like to play this way because we know that um, when playing against our engines nowadays that our engines crunch millions of positions and if something is even slightly unsound against an engine you're going to lose um but you know tell was you know up against human opposition and um uh you know some sort of horrible blunder happened and it seems as though h4 had a little bit of caution to it because there was a threat of rookie five to g5 after all but h4 does weaken g3 for the knight g3 but uh for the weakness of the last move in in these games to become you know critical crunching uh, a basis for crunching tactics later it is remarkable that knight g3 is going to set off another disaster in this game this this weakness of the last move weakening g3 is a basis for a horrible combination pretty soon um so rook f8 so bishop e2 was a key blunder, perhaps. This rook's out of play, as someone's just mentioned, mostly about the a2 rook, yeah. Uh, Randolph said, yeah, the, the rook's out of play. And um, so bishop e2, just a total disaster move, is it? Was Maybe there is an accurate defense that we can try and work out here. Isn't there? What about just b4? Wouldn't b4 just, you know, help the rook's contact each other hi there rooks hi there Do, wouldn't that help second row defense he is a queen up uh one would have thought but he plays the move bishop e2 he just cracks up here bishop e2 um and now tail starts to sort of equalize in material uh, miraculously so bishop takes g2 um, it just ends in, ending up in a winning uh, rook and pawn ending. Strange games, um, and a forceful sequence actually to get ev even more material. Uh, to winning another pawn, bishop after bishop, for rather cruel end to this game. Strange, uh, mysterious, magical games. So um, let's look at another game. <clears throat> so this game is against um Kolarov in 1957 so Mikhail uh, was white actually uh so we'll flip the board so uh Sicilian defense Okay, so open Sicilian, and um, this a6 move is played. Now, obviously, he has played f4 a number of times. In this game, actually, he plays bishop g5. Okay, so knight bd7. Now, he could play f4 here. That's, that's one move, but he plays actually bishop c4. Okay. 
and it seems actually you know when white plays f4 if he had played f4 note that uh you know the bishop's protected when you play f4 and note in this position the bishop's kind of not protected and so black actually maybe is trying to trick white or or trying to refute this outright this idea of of white not playing f4 or maybe this is just theory it could be just very queen a5 because uh, he's threatening two things the bishop and also knight takes e4 because uh, of that pin so queen d2 parrying both is the queen's use on a5 is this justified so early on for the queen to come to a5 i'm not sure actually so e6 and now white castles queen side b5 okay um so uh Mikhail has a choice he could maybe calmly um you know play bishop b3 or could he uh not because bishop b3 maybe b4 the knight moves then knight takes e4 because there's no pin on the queen because the queen's here knight takes e4 would attack these two guys so in this position it looks as though bishop b3 walks into b4 because uh, knight takes e4 looks looks pretty dangerous here if knight c6 b takes c oh knight c6 here that's a point isn't it queen c7 not sure so but anyway uh Mikhail avoided bishop b3 or knight c6 actually he chose another move i wonder if you can guess it um i, I was a victim of bishop takes e6 on the weekend it's, it's sometimes unpleasant if you're playing black to see a move like bishop takes e6 uh, i know from recent experience whoops i think i've just given away the move <laughs> <laughs> sorry sorry uh, okay i think i have to tell you though scrap that that 10 second quiz <laughs> or, or <laughs> no no the 10 seconds quiz has just been ruined sorry bishop takes e6 don't worry there'll be another one in this game so bishop takes e6 okay um <laughs> so it's a bishop sack okay a bishop for two pawns with the king stranded in the center We've got the usual story of this monster knight now octopus knight in all directions so all the monster knight needs is the queen to do something horrible to coordinate with the knight now and it'll be the end of the black king surely okay the black king makes a run for it he plays king f7 but no the monster knight is actually removed immediately because Mikhail targets now d6 so he wants to loosen d6 so he actually takes on f8 to win d6 so he's got three pawns now uh, for that bishop sack okay so i used to think most of the towel games were knight for two pawns rather casually and in my blitz i don't i don't really think twice sometimes about a knight for two pawns but a bishop for two pawns that's a bit dodgy but a bishop for three pawns a bit less dodgy so three four five six seven against four the king's still not particularly safe um but uh b4 is played by black knight d5 which pokes into the dark squares a bit you know e7 check might be useful giving up a2 uh it doesn't really bother about the checks no big deal the king can always go to d2 he just centralizes his rook now the key thing i would say from one of my blitz games this morning is uh, if you are going to allow this uh, you don't want the queens to come off you want to exert maximum pressure of your pieces without allowing a queen exchange at any time i think that's the key you've got to keep the momentum here without simplification from the opponent there must be a way of simulating tower without losing in our own games so we've got to watch out for key ingredients of how the attacks work um he's keeping all the pieces on okay so um <laughs> um Round of no, actually, I think knight f8 uh, in my in my YouTube video today, but we'll, we'll talk about that after 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 this. Okay, so if you want, um, so in this position, 
Okay, free pawns for, for the um, um, for the bishop. Bishop takes f6. And how does black actually recapture here? Is this a problem for black to play knight takes f6? He ends up playing a poxy looking move. G takes f6, which of course looks as though there's an inroad now uh, to the black king. So why couldn't black have played knight takes f6 here? Is there a simple uh, is there a simple refutation here of knight takes f6? Does anyone know? I didn't engine check this game or anything before. Um, is is there an obvious refutation of knight takes f6? Okay, say we throw in a check. Now, if king h8, I can see that knight g6 is pretty destructive winning the rook yeah if king moves you know just take the rook if takes you take the rook so that would draw the king out wouldn't it to um to, to f7 and then would there be a win here in this position e5 looks a bit dangerous uh, maybe you know maybe if the knight moves now you would simply play something like rook d3 anyway to play rook f3 and then you target the, the king and rook maybe this looks quite crushing doesn't it with the king still a target on the f file agree everyone so that looks quite crushing yeah there's probably something even better actually but uh, okay so the opponent played g takes f6 so he allows a seemingly attractive rook lift rook d3 to get to the g file check black takes on b2 now look this is an ingredient this literally is advice for my blitz game earlier today because in the blitz game earlier today i allowed all this kind of stuff i sacrificed the knight but the opponent had queen e5 getting rid of the queens now here is a, a essential ingredient to stop black simplifying the position okay and i'm going to test you guys what does black what does you, what do you do as white to stop black defending this position easily what move do you play here i've given you a clue so 10 seconds starting from now what move do you play here okay yes you want to stop queen e5 so f4, yes, he can still keep this in reserve. You know, he's he's making sure prophylaxis is against simplification of his attack. He wants fuel on the fire, not for the fire to be extinguished. So f4 stops the fire being extinguished. No queen e5 for black. Uh, b3, okay, forcing black onto the counter attack, uh, which is not so bad because the queens are still on. Check. And actually rook takes b3 winning another pawn queen d5 okay what is queen d5 doing i think the queen is now indirectly attacking this queen so if knight g6 takes we would have rook h3 check and then we take the queen so it's quite nicely actually attacking the queen in a way Uh, so black actually is also attacking the rook okay so this is quite a few problems being set for black already um so the queen and the rook are sort of indirectly under fire here so the rook moves okay the rook moves deal with one problem knight g6 may be uh, defendable some other way so knight g6 so as noted h hg there's rook h3 winning the queen so black actually plays king g7 offering some material unfortunately losing even more material he's already lost three pawns for that bishop four pawns and he's about to lose the exchange so tau takes the exchange and starts pushing his extra pawns now e5 um so materially you know white can't be doing that badly now um sorry he's two pawns up now he's two pawns up um 
I, I just thought the initial bishop sacrifice was for three pawns and something happened after that so for him to be two pawns up uh, so black actually for some reason uh, decides uh, that this move is good next um, knight takes e5 knight takes e5 so one question that comes into mind is can't white just play f takes it looks all pretty crushing no f takes would be a complacent move because of rook d7 whoops oh there is a neat little trick for that king on the d file okay avoid that play the check instead it's important to keep the queen on so um <laughs> queen c5 check and actually queen c5 check also uh attacks the bishop so after king j he, he takes the bishop and now of course he can take on e5 because there's no rook d7 anymore or anything he's he's just a whole rook down check queen comes back check king goes into safety now because the queen's covering a1 end of game so that was fairly straightforward <laughs> so uh let's let's have a look at that in overview and summary um so open sicilian again uh, with bishop g5 but not f4 but with bishop c4 seemingly provoking this 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 early queen sortie queen sortie using a bit of french there yeah queen sortie queen exit no i don't know if that's appropriate actually but uh e6 okay so white castles queen side b5 right for a bishop sack here so initially for two pawns uh now three pawns okay so it's three pawns here if we count pawns three four five six seven versus one two three four okay so white three pawns to the bishop now knight d5 so he loses a pawn here loses a two pawn but black's decentralized and white's centralizing okay so white centralizing black's decentralizing uh, but the white king safety is also potentially a problem for 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 counter cheapos bishop takes f6 which seems to make the rook lift very effective check queen takes b2 winning another pawn and introducing the idea of queen e5 that's extinguished with f4 Blacks again on the counter attack with b3. Um, in this position, by the way, um, uh, what was there a problem? Sorry, we didn't ask this. Was there a problem with rook takes b3? Is is queen d4 check a problem? What would be the problem here? Anyone? Is there a problem with rook takes b3 here? Um, it might be good as well yeah he just throws in the check anyway on e7 first and then he takes it maybe it's no big deal so the Queen goes there now Queen d5 so hitting all sorts of things threatening the rook threatening Knight g6 and rook h3 the rook moves Knight g6 so he's picking up more material so black's last roll of the dice was Knight takes e5 hoping Tal would fall into this cheapo tactic um, whoops so if takes then Bishop if rook d7 uh, but no he just wins even more material with check and it's all over so um whole rook up after all that okay interesting so who's up to look just uh, maybe one more game one more game should we have a look at one more game i've got one more game noted uh, to have a look at anyway I don't feel that tired actually haven't been playing that much today uh, so let's go for it so against Geller now Geller was uh, uh, Fisher's you know uh, Geller crushed Fisher a few times does everyone know that he, he was a very dangerous player Geller uh, maybe we should spend one week looking at Geller okay there's there's a few players we can call um, 
uncrowned kings. I'm not sure Geller was actually there was an uncrowned king, so I'm not sure Geller was one of. But anyway, he was one of uh, Fisher's, um, yeah, dangerous opponents. So um, he was white against Geller, 1958 Riga. So e4, e5. So we have here a Royal Lopez. Now, whenever I say Royal Lopez, I'm thinking of uh, Rolls Royce for some reason because it's kind of got the Royal Lopez has got some, some of the characteristics of Rolls Royce because they're both like used at you know high levels of prestige, you know, world championships. The Royal Lopez very popular in world championships, and the and the Rolls Royce as a car is also very prestigious. So somehow I've linked uh, Royal Lopez with Rolls Royce, but I, I, as white, I play Vienna game. I don't play the Royal Lopez, but anyway, so a six. And the bishop retreats to a4. Of course, Roy Lopez, knight f6, castles, bishop e7. All standard Roy Lopez, nothing really to comment on here, except White's inviting a martial gambit. And most GMs nowadays um, avoid the martial gambit. They don't like facing the martial gambit. But at that time, in 1958, there was less fear about the martial gambit, I think. So c3 was played kind of without that much fear for d5. So black actually uh, played d6. Okay, so um, yes, I know, David. Sorry, you say so. Rolls Royce is not Roy. I know it's just it's just an association of prestige. Yeah, I know. I know it's not the same word. It's the prestige of the Royal Lopez at the World Championship level. <laughs> okay, uh, so knight a five. Um, the bishop goes back to c two, and now black plays c five. So this is standard kind of Royal Lopez kind of stuff, which I don't usually play as black. I don't know how many of you play this as black. Does any of you play this as black? It's quite solid, isn't it? It's clamping down on d four. The bishop's maybe got this square. Um, if white plays for d4, d5, I know you can sort of reroute the knight to c5. Uh, also, cd is often annoying. You just put pressure maybe on the c file later. So d4, bishop b7. And now actually Mikhail plays uh, b4. Um, and black takes on b4. And black the black knight goes to the seemingly attractive square. The, the c4 square, knight c4. The knight's challenged and the knight's now protected now with black increasing the central tension as well by playing d5. So it looks as though um, Geller is playing very actively. These bishops are extending in scope. Central tension has been maximized. Uh, we often see Magnus Carlsen, the black side of Royal players, you know, playing for such central tension, usually getting a good game. So e takes d5, e takes d4. Might takes on c4. B takes c4. Now surely the, the pawn on d5 is loose here. Is white about to lose a major pawn? Queen takes d4. And also b4 is also a, a pre. Uh, the thing is, if queen takes d5, I think white just takes on e7 the bishops and pre so that's that's not playable if bishop takes d5 then then what um anyone interesting um there's also the b pawn let's let's look at the game anyway okay let's let's follow the game i'm sure that there's something there so bishop takes b4 Sorry, rookie rookie five is mentioned. Sorry, okay. Let, let's let's just briefly check this out. Bishop, sorry, if bishop takes d five, someone is saying rook e five. Really? What about bishop g five? Someone else is saying bishop g five. Rump plump possession. Bishop g five. Interesting. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, 
All right. All right. There's two pawns and pre. Uh, okay. The the b pawn was taken, and um, now the exchange is offered with rook b1. So he he sacks the exchange. He's allowing an exchange sack. So he's the exchange down. Uh, but uh, the the d pawn can't be taken now because the bishop has to move out or be protected. It's protected with rook e8. So what was the purpose of this this variation? The exchange sack variation. The exchange down. Now, unlike Petrosian, uh, the purpose of exchange sacks in the Tau world uh, is usually to sort of get a winning, uh, crushing attack. In, in the Petrosian world, the purpose of an exchange sack is to accelerate some sort of uh, Nimzovician uh, principle of positional security um, to avoid losing at all costs. So you get loads of draws from exchange sacks in Petrosian games and loads of wins in, in Tau games from the exchange sacks. Uh, so, so how how does this exchange that help White's attack? Well, these bishops do seem to be sort of pointing in the vague direction of the king. There's a rook on the seventh, eyeing f7. There's a knight ready to spring to e5 and, and g5. The pawn might be useful for pivot points c7, e7, and there's a tactical liability to gain further tempo uh, on e1. Okay, so um, Black plays now queen c8. And um, the rook, of course, is, is attacked, but it's ignored now. Another potential kind of exchange sack uh, to really do damage, potentially, to the black king position, bishop g5. So if the rook's taken, it looks pretty bad for the black's king after bishop f6. Um, but um, Geller now plays uh, a very interesting move here. Uh, he plays, actually, rook e2 uh, of course attacking uh, this bishop looks as though that's going to be very handy as well but uh, Tao uh, attacks the queen now with rook c7 okay so queen e6 so again we, we've got this kind of threat of rook takes c2 now Mikhail takes on e1 check king h2 so white's still um the exchange down but the bishops look a little bit more menacing than before there's there's more concrete threat with that bishop this bishop's still pointing there this rook is still pointing at f7 and this pawn's still a nice pivot for e7 at the very least so even though it's the exchange down um it still looks dangerous so um Geller plays rook d8 and now Mikhail takes on f6, fracturing black's pawn structure. Uh, but also, um, you know, if g takes, uh, if queen takes, uh, I think we need to look at queen takes, because in the game, it seems here that g takes runs into something horrible and unexpected, and not actually to do immediately with black's king safety, but... Um, unprotected pieces. Uh, Mikhail here plays rook e7. Uh, now one question that comes into mind here, uh, well rook e7 would seem to be skewering, okay, but what if what if queen takes e7 here? Because surely d takes Rook takes and the pawn's not going anywhere. Uh, what would be played in this position by white? Does, does anyone know? I'm, I'm, I'm probably missing something obvious here. I think it's just check, isn't it? It's these Wishens are check. It's these Wishens are killers. So check and then taking the queen. Ouch. So rook e7 does seem to be quite crushing then on, on this g takes f. And the game uh, didn't last that long. Um, after uh, takes, he was like a bishop up. He's, he's ended up a bishop up. Uh, it seems to be totally lost for black. He played on a few more moves, but he's just a bishop down for not much. And he resigned here. 
so I think we need to rewind to see this bishop takes f6 again. So couldn't black have played uh, queen takes f6? Uh, is there a disaster lurking here? Actually, there's there's another reason why Tau always um, ends up ahead in games I show you because um, I always pick uh, Tau wins. Actually, <laughs> uh, he did lose a lot of games as well. I know I know he became world champion, but you know um, I'm <laughs> so so. Please don't be surprised that if every game I show you is a win, yeah, because that's how the game collections of Tau are usually biased. That they're usually just his wins. Um, you know, to celebrate a player, you don't usually celebrate by showing their horrible losses. So, but here, okay, what happens after Queen takes f6, though? So, Queen takes f6. Can it, can anyone see, could, could White actually win this position? Is there a way? Anyone? Would this be better than what was played? It looks as though black's um, okay here, superficially. Okay, let's let's give queen c four a shot. Queen takes c four. So we're just, uh, well, there's queen takes d6 check. That looks pretty nasty. That can't be right, queen c4. Surely. Rook c4? Well, again, there's, there's queen d6 check. Whoops, queen queen takes d6 check. Oh, no, no, sorry, you've taken then back row mate. Sorry, yeah, okay. So, um, sorry, uh, rook takes c4. Yeah. Um, well, this this pawn looks a bit dangerous now. Um, so, so you know, maybe maybe the pawn's going to be supported soon if if queen takes. Um, may, maybe um, Geller didn't like that. He's a pawn for the exchange. Um, okay. Uh, any anything else? So rook takes c4. Does everyone agree rook takes c4 might be the strongest uh, move here after queen takes f6? Is that is that right? We agree rook takes c4 here, do we? Oh sorry, sorry. Warrior has written queen takes f6 and then d7. All right, let's have a look. Queen takes f6, d7. Ah, so this passed pawn is coming into play here because now there's a threat of rook c8. So there's no rook d1, of course, because of that bishop. Um, if we try and, def you know, like, let's try this. Then bishop f5 looks strong. Because now there's a threat of rook c8. Is black busted here? It looks as though black might be busted here. The exchange up. Because this pawn looks quite crushing. He can't chop the pawn without losing a rook. How does black defend against rook c8? This is winning, isn't it? This is winning. I suppose king g7. Or you could end up with a better rook and pawn ending. Um, a pawn up with, with, with an advantage, maybe. If you, if you take here, black has to counter sack. And you end up with a better sort of rook and pawn ending. So that might might be um Okay, that maybe maybe Geller had seen this from this position and he, he thought it was better to play uh it doesn't look too convincing though, does it? So Geller just blundered it seems horribly with G takes F six. Uh so rookie seven was just winning material. Skewer, queen and rook. 
oh well so um i hope you enjoyed this week uh that's the end of my selection of games um I'll, I'll be uploading this to YouTube. I uh, hope you got something from these games. Uh, maybe some more tactical awareness of Zwischen Zugs, Double Zwischen Zugs, Unprotected Pieces. Um, yeah, putting pressure on the opponent. Uh, okay. Um, all right. Thanks, thanks very much. So uh, see you next week. And this will be on YouTube.com Kings Crusher. So YouTube.com. King's Crusher. Oh, sorry. How is the rook ending better for white? I don't think it is. I don't, maybe you just didn't fancy a draw. I, we need to check with, with an engine here. This looks as though it might have been better to play queen f6. So we're saying we, the proposal was queen takes f6 and d7. Rook e7, bishop f5. Bishop f5 would seem to be logical, protecting the pawn and supporting rook c8. King g7 would seem to be the best move. I don't know what white does. He can't... To, to avoid the rook and pawn ending. Yeah. Well, if you can find improvements, please can you tell me next week. Have a look at these games and find defensive improvements for all of Tal's opponents. And, and maybe I can present them next week. <laughs> or just put them on YouTube. I'll be uploading to YouTube, so just just put it in the messages on YouTube uh, for the best play. Uh, may, you know, maybe. Uh, okay, so YouTube Con Kings Crusher. Thanks very much. All right, so uh, see you next week. Now, cheers.